Hello, Good Morning Lighthouse. You know the drill. Keep sending questions to questions at lighthousebaptist.net. Also, if you have uh, friends that you think might benefit from these videos, uh, can't get too much scripture in these times of ours, so feel free to share these videos. Uh, if you like them, that's appreciative. Uh, and if you haven't, subscribed to the channel. We do this every weekday during the coronavirus stuff, and uh, maybe we'll keep a little of that going. Maybe not every day when we're back to normal, but a little uh, a little devotional action is always a good thing. Hey, uh, we are still in the Minor Prophets. We are going to be in Hosea for three days. Um, in that time, we'll also do a question and conversation thing. Um, but uh, but yeah, we're going to continue our kind of consideration of the minor prophets. And, you know, maybe we'll make this the time that, hey, what did you do during the coronavirus of 2020? Say, man, I really got to know the minor prophets. I figured out what was going on there. So Hosea is, we're still in the north. We just made our way through Jonah. And again, these are devotions, not sermons. I look forward to someday from the pulpit preaching through in a little more detail or or maybe even better teaching classes that, that really dig into all the historical stuff. But but we're still in the north. We're in the, the northern kingdom of Israel. And Assyria is still looming. And, you know, if you just read, oh, well, you know, Assyria came in in 722 and it, it wasn't just exile, it was captured, like to never return um, the, the people of the northern kingdoms. You might think, well, um, you know, this is just political stuff or this is just military stuff. And, and you might miss that there are actually spiritual reasons for this. God is allowing, God is, this is, this is part of God's work in the world, even to have his people suffer. And you go, gosh, but that seems brutal. Like, isn't God on Israel's side? Word, yeah, God is on Israel's side. Well, then what is going on? Well, Hosea is a book that explains to us the what was going on in Israel that was so devastating um, to the point where God s said, man, there is a breach of relationship. He uses even words like divorce here. And, and you know, I think this challenges us is because we sometimes can think of our relationship with God and we put bumper stickers on cars. Remember bumper stickers? Not so many of those anymore, but, um, but, uh, but they say, you know, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. And we say that and we know it and we believe it, but then we live like this is actually like the, our relationship with God is like our relationship with our favorite restaurant or, or like our relationship with, you know, a fraternity and a, and a, and there's other fraternities out there that maybe we might think about joining or whatever. And, you know, it's, it's just not true. Like the, the intimacy between God and his people can easily be missed. And, and yet from God's perspective, what's going on here is not just you believe these things. And so you're in my club, but this is family stuff. This is marriage stuff between the bride of Christ and God himself. This is adoption into the kingdom of God. Not like you adopt a line of thinking, but like you adopt a child. Like there is this intimacy between God's people and God that if we miss it, we, you know, are not only missing out on the good things of, of our faith, this actual not just friendship, but love relationship between us and God. But we're also, it's really easy to slip into idolatry because if you start thinking about this is a way of thought or this is a philosophical stance, um, my relationship with God is primarily the things I think are right and wrong or, or what I believe about certain religious precepts. Well, Man, it's real easy to go, well, I'll take a little of this and a little of this and a little of this and a little of this. And, and man, people for all time have done that. And we need to be really careful not to say Israel is exactly the same as the church because Israel is not exactly the same as the church. Israel was primarily the people of God in the covenant land of God where the church is a multinational, every tribe, um, um called out in a different way than Israel was called out. Israel was called out on their land for God to be the God of that nation so that they could be a light to the nations. But we live in a, in a different covenant where our relationship with God, um, you know, permeates every culture. But we have to think about 
how much God loves us. And the book of Hosea is a book that really uses some of the harshest, I would even say some of the grossest language that you're ever going to find in Scripture to describe the relationship break between God and the idolatrous people in family terms. Well, we'll take three weeks or three, I'm sorry, three little devotional times to work through Hosea, but man, be ready. This is a little rough. And in the middle of all of the rough language, we need to be asking ourselves, why is God taking this so seriously? Why is he making Hosea do this? Why would he use such like emotionally charged language? Well, it's because that's how much he loves us. And it's because when we are walking away from God, we are not walking away from a line of thinking or our favorite establishment, but we're walking away from a covenant love familial relationship. So Hosea starts off Hosea 1, uh, 1 to 2. It says, The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take to yourself a wife of whoredom a prostitute, and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom for the sake of the Lord. I got to admit, that's hard for me to read. Like, that's language that I don't use very often. Like, I, I don't, I, I can't tell you if there was ever a time in my life where I just used the word whoredom. That, there's a, a, a difficulty just because it's such a judgmental word, such a charged word. So, Why would God use such gross language? Well, I'll tell you, it's supposed to be gross. It's supposed to shock us. We're supposed to go, don't do that, Hosea. Why would you do that? Because God wants us to know that in that same, like, like we would think this is a, 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 a wife of whoredom, a wife who would like regularly join herself to other men and and like just this would be the most ridiculous the most difficult the the most unmarriage like unpromise keeping marriage you could think of and and God um, wants Israel to know well that's exactly what you're doing I'm your husband I've You know, I I rescued you from Egypt and I put you in the promised land and we had a covenant here, Israel. You know, isn't it weird that when we talk in general terms, sometimes it sounds like, well, Israel made bad choices or whatever. But when it turns personal, like what God is asking Hosea to do is a living parable in the same way that the parables in the New Testament, we're supposed to read them and we're supposed to not just go, oh, that's what happened, but we're supposed to think about them, meditate on them. We're supposed to go, gosh, what does this mean? Jose is being asked to live out this parable where we're supposed to look at Hosea's life and go, what could this mean? This is, this is an incredibly difficult thing to do. It's noteworthy, too, that, that God does not just use this kind of adultery language in the Old Testament, or just in Hosea, you remember in James 4, he says exactly the same thing. James is writing to a church that is is not honoring God first and foremost. And he's saying, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity towards God? What a terrible word. I can't think of an uglier word than adultery. You know, I, I love my wife and the idea that one of us would break the marriage covenant and and join with another person. It's it's beyond my, I can imagine that would be top two or three most hurtful things that could ever happen in my life. And so we need to think about God saying idolatry, rebellion, us having a little bit of God and a little bit of something else. This is not just, well, we all you know see the world the way we see the world. But when we have a covenant relationship with God, This is the language of our rebellion. This is the language of the idolatry of Israel is adultery. Well, we might think, why, what happened that would cause God to use this kind of intense language? In what way did Israel forsake this marriage covenant with the Lord? Well, Hosea goes on to say, um, 
And the Lord said, calling to him, well, okay, so verse three. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore a son. Interesting that it says she conceived and bore him a son. So apparently this son is um, biologically Hosea's. And verse four, and the Lord said to him, call his name Jezreel, for just in a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And on that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And you go, okay, well, what's this all about Jezreel? Like, what's going on here? Well, this is a re reference back to 1 Kings 21, and this is a story that might be familiar to some of you, but it's a story about something that happened in the, in this valley of Jezreel that's not too far away from the the palace where the king lives and and it's the story of Naboth's vineyard and in 1 Kings 21 says this now Naboth the Jezreelite ah the Jezreelite had a vineyard in Jezreel all right so this is um, this is near the, like the second home of, um, of King Ahab beside the palace of King Ahab in Samaria and after um, and after this, Ahab said to Naboth, give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden because it is near my house. And I, I will give you a better vineyard for it. If it seems good to you, I will give you its value in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give you the, the inheritance of my father. See, Naboth is a godly man, apparently. And he says, how could I give you what God has given me? And not only that, Ahab and you're a Baal worshiper and Yahweh gave me this land. And this begins to set up in the book of Hosea, kind of this battle or this like allegiance thing between God and the Baals. And so, so this is something that went on sometime before Hosea. And yet God says, man, I, I still remember that this is the line of these Kings. This is the line of the nation that you still behave like this. So it goes on and, it says, and Ahab went, to his, went into his house sullen because of what Naboth the Jezreelite had said to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed and turned his face away and would eat no food. Quite a leader, huh? What a joker. But Jezebel, his wife, came, came to him and said, Why is your spirit so vexed that you eat no food? And he said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and, and uh, said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else, if you please, I will give you another vineyard for it. But he answered, I will not give you the vineyard. And Jezebel, his wife, said to him, Do you now govern Israel? Arise and eat bread and let your heart be cheerful, and I will give you the, uh, the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. And so Jezebel hatches a plan that actually ends up in Naboth's death. And after she has Naboth murdered, she says, hey, husband, there you go. This dude is weak. But there's some question that Jezebel asks that's really important. She says, do you not rule Israel? Well, the king is not supposed to be the only ruler in Israel. In fact, he's supposed to be an under shepherd. It's supposed to be God that rules in Israel. And what Israel has done is not only begun worshiping Baals, but begun just not recognizing the supremacy, the kingship of God in their land. So back to Hosea. And again, this story does set up kind of this, I don't know if you call it a contest or, or you say, look, God has established you, Israel. He has called you. And yet you're wandering away to the bales. And I'm telling you, this is exactly like getting married and then wandering off to another man. Hosea has other fam family language. In Hosea 11, we'll talk about it in a couple of days, um, he says, look, this is like having a son walk away from you your rebellion to me. Hosea 13, one through four says, now when Ephraim spoke, there was trembling. He, he was exalted in Israel, but he incurred guilt through Baal and died. And now they sin more and more and they make for themselves metal images, idols of skillful, skillfully made of their silver and all the work of their craftsmen. And it is said to them, those who offer human sacrifice kiss calves. Therefore, so we're talking about human sacrifice. This is not just, well, we've decided to think theologically differently about things. This is they're wandering off into terrible practices, into, you know, temple prostitution and human sacrifice and terrible things. Verse four of that chapter says, but I'm the Lord, your God from the um, 
from the land of Egypt. You know no God but me. Besides me, there is no Savior. This is God saying, come home. I love you. I want you. Israel, you're acting like we don't have a relationship. You're acting unmarried. So how do we land this in our lives? Do you know how serious God takes his relationship with you? Do you know that this is not just God trying to gather the most, you know, the most likes or the most subscribers or the most followers or or the most people, but rather this is family stuff to God. He loves you like the best dad in the whole world perfectly might love his children. He loves you like the best husband in the whole world might perfectly love his beloved wife. So as we honor things that aren't him, as we find our hope in idols, and you know, we talk about what idolatry means a lot, but idolatry is just when you make when you make good things the best things. Tim Keller says when you make good things ultimate things, it's a great way to think about it. When we find our hope, when we find our satisfaction, when we find our, our reason for being in something other than God. And it's not just that God is petty. He's not petty. He's in love. He loves you. So in your day-to-day, would you begin to think about treating God not just as um, someone to be feared, which is appropriate, not just as someone who is the truth, which is absolutely appropriate. But would you begin thinking, how would you treat God if you really understood the intimate, loving um, relationship that he desires to have with you? Would you talk to him more? Would you delight in him more? Would you trust him more? And would you turn less to sin, less to selfishness, less to other things, and instead turn to him. Have a great day.